And so today we're going to get to another change that took place in the Bible by these birds of the air that came and lodged in the branches of the tree, as Jesus said, with the goal of corrupting the church. And this was what is called the Logos theology. And, and, and we are heavily into it because we don't understand the origins of it and what was done by the Greeks and the Romans when they came into the church. And this occurred particularly uh, in the uh, second century. And we hear this word logos, that Jesus is the logos. When you hear that, it is pagan theology that, that stole its way into the church in the second century. And we're going to be talking about that over the next, uh, this week and also next week. So after perverting the gospel, the gospels with a Trinitarian theology, the emerging Catholic movement went on to work to went on to work on reading Greek thought and philosophy into the readings of the gospel, and they turned their attention to the gospel of John, where it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was made was with God, and the word was God and the word was made flesh. I want to stop there and we're going to address those two verses and we're going to look at verses 2, 3, and 4 next week. But here uh, uh, the Greeks took hold to bring their theology in, their pagan Greek Platonic theology in. They, they, they moved in on uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, and the word was made flesh. We even today say the word was God, which is not what the what is, which is not what John uh, was saying. Uh, we'll go more into the detail in a moment. Since the Greek word for word is logos, thus began the logos theology. So the, the, the English word Greek translated, the, the English word word translated into Greek is logos. This theology's goal, the goal was to make the word to be Jesus, which is not what John said, and to make the word, which is an it, which we're going to show next week, to make the word which when John wrote it, he said it to make that word a him and then to make that word a son and then to make that word separate from God. And so that's the, the Logos theology. The whole goal is to make the monotheistic God polytheistic, to make him more than one. And of course, today it's three. So the theology's goal of the, the Logos theology was, one, to make the word Jesus when your word is not you, but what you speak, and then to make the word, which should be an it, no longer an it, but a him, make it a son, and then make that son separate from God. In fact, John's writings, where he said, and the word was God, is the same as you saying, my word is my bond. And so when John wrote the word was God, what John is saying is the, the word is God's bond and what God says is going to happen. We, we're going to see that with, with the scripture. Uh, because in Genesis, when we go back to Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, it said in the beginning God said. And when God spoke, things happened. And that's the same as saying my word is my bond. I remember when I co-signed for somebody and got in, he got in trouble and wouldn't pay the bill and they came back on me and I told them, I said, I'm going to have to pay the bill because all I got left, I'm not rich, all I got left is my name. And so therefore I got to stay, if I lose my name, I lose everything. And so God, when it said, for example, the word was made flesh, what it's saying is that if God said that a child was going to be born, a child is going to be born and there's nobody that can stop it. All the prophecies that took place manifested themselves in the fulfillment of the prophecy. So what the word said was going to happen. And so John is saying the word was God, God's word is his bond. 
If he said it, it's going to happen. And that's the same as God saying, if I said it, it's going to happen. The second century was the time when this Logos theology began to grow. And believe me, I hear it in apostolic churches as well. And there were apostolics who stood up and opposed this Logos uh, theology in the second century. The, the teaching that the word was separate from God. When your word is you, but your word is your bond, which is what that means. And those who opposed the teaching that the word was separate from God, they were called uh, uh Elo, elogi, elo, elogi, el, elogi. I'll say elogi until I get the right pronunciation of it. The elogi have some have sometimes been classified as monarchians. If you heard me say earlier, uh, apostolics were called patricians. That was name calling during that time. They were called modelists. That name still stands today. They were called uh, monarchians because monarch means king, and we believe that Jesus is God. They believe Jesus is God. They were called patriprations because if you said Jesus is God, that meant that that if Jesus is God, and that means Jesus is the Father, and so now you're saying the Father died, and we're saying the Father can't die, and so patriprations mean those people who believe that Jesus that 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 the Father died, and so uh, so th this name Elogi was was given to apostolics as well. Today, we get names such as holy rollers and Jesus only. That's the same as calling somebody back then a, a, a monolith, a, a monarchian, and a protipration. Today, it's called holy roller, Jesus only. You one God people. The Logos theology taught that there was God the Word as well as God the Father, and that God the Word was the Son, Jesus necessitating that the word has to become a him and no longer an it. John was saying that the word was what God spoke and therefore the word is not a he or a she but an it because the word is an it. Thus the, the Logos theology was essentially that God and the word are separate, separate beings, separate entities, and therefore, the word was another God. Hence, that's why it's called the, the, Logos, the, the Logos theology. In the second century, again, we said there were those who opposed, it, who opposed that doctrine. Those who were apostolic oneness. Unfortunately, uh, only the writings of those who held the Logos teachings have survived. And, and as I said, the only reason we know about Sibelius, who was an apostolic preacher, the only reason we know about Noetus and others who were apostolic preachers is not because we have their writings. Their writings were destroyed. We know about them because those who destroyed their writings wrote about them. Those orthodox teachers and leaders who opposed the Logos doctrine, which stated that Christ was a separate and distinct agent from God the Father, they were called Elegy, meaning they were against the Logos or they didn't believe in the Logos. Those labeled Elegy then were against the teaching that the Word was separate from God, were against the teaching that the Word was another person or God. Again, those who taught that God is the Word <clears throat> and that there is no separation between the Word and God like there's no separation between me and my word, we're given the name Elegy. If you remember, the Orthodox Christians who opposed this spurious second century Logos theology were also called Patriprations, Menarchians, Sibelians. If it was today, they would be called Jesus only, Holy Rollers. Uh, 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 and they were given those names by their Trinitarian uh, opponents who promoted or espoused the Logos, the Logos theology. So let's hear what one John Henry Brunt, Blunt, a renowned Trinitarian historian, had to say concerning the Catholic understanding of 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and verse 15, and then that word was made flesh. What he had to say regarding this Logos theology that was promoted by in the second century by, by those who were stealing into the faith that would later be known as Catholics. And here it is again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh. And here's what he had to say. He said, and, and, and this is a Trinitarian Catholic 
historian. And I, I have writings by earnest, honest, Trinitarian, Catholic historians, and because they are purists and historians, they're saying, this is what we believe, but this is not what the word says, but it is what we believe and what our tradition says, but it is, it is not that that was taught historically by the, the, the writers of the gospel. And so what he had to say was, a Catholic Christian believes that Christ is the incarnation of the second person in the Godhead, namely known as God the Word or God the Logos. So who is God to, 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 uh, uh, to those that believe in this Logos theology? Who is God the Word and who is God the Logos? They say it is not God the Father, it is Christ, uh, Jesus Christ, the incarnation of the second person uh, of the Godhead. This he said, this, now remember, this is a Catholic historian. He said, this is not clearly taught by the Bible, neither by Christ, neither by any of the apostles, and definitely wasn't taught by John. And yet they're quoting from John's gospel. Now what does Levi Payne, uh, uh, before 1900, what did he have to say about this uh, Logos theology? He even gives the name of the, uh, of the apostolic father who is the father of the Logos theology. And I once held him in esteem, and it's from his name that we get the word martyr. He said, um, Payne said, there is no trace of Logos theology until Justin Martyr, who lived more than a century after the death of Christ. He continues saying, none of the post-apostolic fathers before Justin Martyrs alluded to a Logos theology being found anywhere in the Gospel of John. He said, Justin Martyr plainly drew his Logos doctrine from Greek philosophic sources and not the Bible. And these are the men who stole into the church that Jesus talked about and we consider and call them apostolic fathers. And I used to call them apostolic fathers. And some of our church uh, bylaw books have them listed in the bylaw book. And once I understood that, we redid our bylaw book and took all these Greeks out of it. So Justin Martyr plainly drew his Logos theology, um, uh, Payne said, from Greek philosophical thought and not from the Bible. He also said, uh, when Justin Martyr promoted this Logos theology, he couldn't even quote the fourth gospel to find anything in the fourth gospel to defend what he uh, was promoting, that Jesus is the Word and the Word is a second person in the Godhead. He continued to say he never referred to that, Justin Martyr never referred to that gospel at all. And again, I think it's uh, it's, it's significant that it'll be, it, it is, 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 it's interesting to me that if I were a student of Bishop Kenneth Hoke, when his day is over, I'm the next one to emerge on the scene. So it's interesting to me that if Timothy and Titus and Silas were students of Paul, when Paul passes off of the scene and the New Testament's manuscripts are closed, the apostolic fathers that we should be seeing emerging in the first century and the second century would have been Timothy, Titus, and uh, Silas. But we don't see them. All of a sudden, they disappear from history. And I would really love to know what happened to them. They disappear from history and was placed with, is with Clements of Rome, Justin Martyr, Polycarp, who was supposed to have been an apostle of, of, of uh, John, and, and, and others. Greeks, just as Jesus intimated that they were going to come and lodge in the branches of the tree with the goal of corrupting the church, and they've done a great job at it because those scriptures are still existent within our Bibles today. For God has never left himself without a witness. Tain, Payne further said, this shows how late after the apostles that this new doctrine, this was more than a century after the last apostle was dead, that this new doctrine was read into the Gospel of John. 
Such an erroneous teaching found no acceptance among Christian Jews who believed Jesus Christ to be God and did not believe Christ to be a person and separated from God. As a matter of fact, it's in Job chapter number 13 where God says, and I'm just paraphrasing, I will slap you in the face if you refer to me as a person. And how dare anybody make God human to the point that they will call him a person. And God said, uh, and, and, and it is abhorrent to him, and listen to how he says this in Job chapter 13, if you do secretly worship persons, plural, which means that even in the days of Job, God knew that there was going to come a, um, there was going to come a, a spurious faith that would have more than one person because he didn't say I will, uh, I will judge you if you secretly worship person singular, but he said persons plural. And so uh, Payne said, such an erroneous teaching found no acceptance among Jewish Christians who believed Jesus Christ to be God and did not believe Christ to be a person that is separate from God. These teachings began because of a concentration of Gentile Christians who had Greek education. They were students of, of the school of Plato and Pythagoras. They had a background in Greek philosophy, and this fulfills the warning of Jesus when he gave the parable that he gave concerning uh, that seed growing, the greatest of herbs becoming a tree, and also the fact that when Greeks came to see Jesus, he refused to see them because he knew that this was going to occur. So let's look at what he said again. Jesus said in that parable, Matthew chapter 13, the theme of this study, he said to his disciples, his, well, the scriptures, another parable put he forth unto his disciples, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed. That's the infant church. It was only 11 when he went up, which a man took. That man was Jesus, sowed in a field. That field was the world, which indeed is the least of all seed, because there's just a handful of them. And when it was grown, and as men tried to stop their movement, in Acts it was said they turned the world upside down. It became the greatest of herbs. And if you can't destroy it on the outside, what do you do? You get on the inside. It was the greatest among herbs. It became a tree. It couldn't be stopped. And so the birds of the air, and the birds of the air in the Bible always represent sin and evil. So that the birds of the air came and lodged in the branches of the tree. And that goal was to take over the power of the tree. But look at what Paul had to say to Timothy concerning what was going to happen. It says, O Timothy. Keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and opposition of science falsely so-called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. And that ends the, the, uh, the book of 1 Timothy. Amen. But let's go back to what he says in verse number 20. He says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and opposition of, and that word shouldn't be science. The Greek word is gnosis. Uh, or we hear it today as Gnostics, Paul was saying that there was a teaching that was beginning to emerge in his day that was called Gnosticism, and he was telling Paul to avoid Gnosticism. Of course, that was reinterpreted to say science. So Timothy, keep that which you committed to thy trust, avoid profane and vain babblings and opposition of a teaching that was coming at that time, Gnosis, and whatever that teaching is, Paul says, is false. And some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Uh, and then Jude gave a warning concerning what was creeping into the church. In Jude chapter 1, verse 4, he says, Certain men have crept in unaware who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Who are they? Ungodly men. What are they doing? Turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, which we're going to be getting to in the later presentations, because to, because to bring, to bring a pagan theology into a monotheistic apostolic oneness all the pagan religions of the world always had three there was the father there was the mother and there was the son the goal is to ultimately work into the churches we're going to see in the later presentations uh, sessions they they have got to work into the church a woman because at this time all we all we are merging with is a father separated from a son separated from a holy ghost but their pagan practices is there's got to be a woman in there somewhere and ultimately and eventually over time as we're going to see they've got to have a father a mother and a son and that's what the ultimate goal is and Jude said these are certain men that crept in unaware who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, <clears throat> ungodly men, 
turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go back again. Uh, it says, and, if you remember from an earlier session, we're saying those conjunctions were even, <clears throat> those conjunctions were even changed, and, and these men chose to take the Greek word chi and make it to say and to separate God from the Lord Jesus when it should have properly been interpreted as even, which means, uh, and denying the only Lord God, even our Lord Jesus Christ, which then would make Jesus Christ God. To say the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus and separates the two, the Greek word chi, that Greek word chi, as we talked earlier, can also mean even, and it should be properly done there. And at least one place in the epistles, it is interpreted as even, because even would make the Lord God and Jesus, amen, the same. The only Lord God, even our Lord Jesus Christ, but here they've got it separated. So that's another change that have taken place. And also remember, uh, uh, when you talk about impact on the Bible, if you really want to talk about impact on the Bible, then realize, verses is man-made, separating into verses. Numbering the verses is man-made. Chapters is man-made. All punctuation marks are man-made. Besides what they did by moving a punctuation mark, from, by putting a punctuation mark, and in Greek, in, in Hebrew, there were no punctuation marks, but taking a punctuation mark and putting it where you want to can change, uh, uh, can change an inflection. Uh, for example, Zig Ziglar said it depends on the inflection. Uh, if you just monotone, he did not say he killed his wife. Well, inflections change it. He did not say he killed his wife. That means somebody else may have said it. He did not say he killed his wife. That means he said something else. He did not say he killed his wife. Oh, well, maybe he killed his dog. <laughs> and so by taking these punctuation marks and moving them around, and all of these are man-made, and we're not for the fact of the anointing and the Holy Ghost moving us, and teachings and, and, and preserving history, we are able to get into God's word because he scattered truth throughout the Bible that we are able to pick through and find out what the, what the scriptures really said. In fact, there was one person that said, God is so wise. Why are the original manuscripts written by the disciples gone? Why are they gone? You can't find them. They don't exist anymore. Because if these men had gotten to the original manuscripts and changed those, they'd pull out the original manuscripts and say, this is what it says, and here's the proof. So the man, so original manuscripts uh, cannot be found uh, for that reason. Then, why is it a little here and a little there? The Bible is such that truth has been scattered throughout the Bible that any changes that have been made, you can start comparing one scripture with another and arrive at truth. Another person said, since so much writings have been taken place by the Bible, if someone was to take the Bible, that's why these, uh, these Catholic historians can arrive at the fact that what you're saying the Bible said is not what the Bible said, because uh, one, one writer said, God is so wise and the Bible has been written about so much that if you actually destroyed the Bible, you could actually get all the writings of everyone that have ever written anything about the Bible and reconstruct the Bible. So you can never destroy God's, you can never destroy God's truth. And that's how we are able to arrive at the things that we're talking about. To say that Jesus never said what he said in Matthew 28, 19. Uh, John never said what he said in 1 John 5 and 7. God never said, let us, he said, I will make. He never said uh, in the beginning Elohim, he said in the beginning El. Because you can, you can arrive at the truth of the scriptures through study and through God's word, which we're going to see in a moment. The root of Trinitarianism are to be mainly found because of Greek philosophy and a later teaching that was even emerging in the days of Paul called Gnosticism, and that's why Paul said, don't hold to the teachings of the Gnostics, but that word was interpreted in our Bible as science. 
Monotheism and those that protested, they were called monarchians, or they were called uh, they were called patricians. Everyone, uh, even today, uh, uh, those that are fighting against that theology, there go those oneness Jesus only holy rolling apostolics. <laughs> and so those that went against them, they were called elegists, they were called monarchians, they were called participations. The one that pervade today is modelist. That one is held over from the second century. We're, we're called modelists. And, and of course, I stand up and say, yes, I am one. Hence, Gnosticism, which is what Paul was warning uh, Timothy against, was rearing his head even during the lifetime of Paul, uh, if you remember what Paul said. He said, oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoid profane and vain babblings and opposition of Gnosis, falsely so-called, and some professioning have erred concerning the faith. The Gnostics taught that the creation, and Gnosticism is raising his head today again, taught that the creation was a progress of all things flowing out or emanating. And so things, uh, uh, things, uh, uh, things are just flowing out from original truth. Even a historian, and I have his complete history, Philo the Jew, used such language because he was a student of Plato as well. Gnosticism started out as Greek philosophy because everything flows out, then we got to separate everything. And so Jesus was split into there is the man Jesus, so we got two Jesus as far as the Gnostics are concerned, and they're arguing over, over the power of each of them. You've got the man Jesus, and you've got the spirit of Jesus. Uh, so there are two separate entities. There's the man Jesus, and there's the, there's the spirit Jesus, and they're separate one from another. The same philosophy Gnosticism separates one God into two persons, and then ultimately it went into three persons. But remember, they have not reached their end goal until they can get a woman in there, the mother. The same philosophy separated the one God into two persons, then three. The early apostolics witnessed this and in turn uh, pro protested against it at every opportunity. Clearly, the early church teachings in regard to, uh, the early church teaching in regard to uh, Gnosticism is found in certain writings, for example, 1 John. Little children, it is the last time, and as you have heard, the Antichrist shall come even now. Are there many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time they went out from us? Yeah, they came in with us. Uh, so, yeah, all right, if Polycarp was a disciple of John, then he came in with us, but then he left because he began to teach other things that John didn't teach after his death. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that it might be made manifest that they were not uh, of us. Another scripture uh, from John, but ye have an unction, well, continuation, from the Holy Ghost, as ye know all things, and I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, because you know it, and there, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. And if he does that, he's the Antichrist that denieth the Father, uh, what should it be? The Father Kai the Son. What should it be? The Father Kai the Son. They chose and, but we can choose even. The Father, even the Son. And, and when it comes to, to, to oneness theology, the Kai of the Greeks should be more correctly interpreted to fall in alignment with the teachings of the prophets and the apostles and Jesus. Kai should be interpreted as even and not an. They chose an and not even. Another, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist, Gnosticism. O Timothy, again, well, we've quoted that two times, but it's worth quoting again because I'm zeroing in on that word science. It's not the opposition of science because science will prove God in its pureness. What Paul was talking about was a theology that was stealing into the church even while he was alive, Gnosticism. Hence, as to the Logos theology, making the word a he or a him, the real question to be answered is, according to the scriptures, is the word, a him, or is the word scripturally an it? So which sentence makes most sense? I gave my word and I kept it. Or I gave my word and I kept him. <laughs> which one makes more sense? So that by itself would tell you God's word, is it an it 
or is it a him? And if it is an it, why is it a him in 1 John chapter 1, which we're going to go into next week, this conspiracy of the Logos theology. Which pronoun, well, let's let God and the prophets answer the question. Which pronoun, when it came to the word, is used by God and the prophets? An example is Isaiah 55 and 1. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the things whereunto I sent it. I think God is trying to make a point to use it four times in the same verse. And if it's God's word is an it by God, and it is an it by the prophets, how did it get to be a he in First John? I mean, in St. John chapter number one. Have you, have you ever wondered why English translators of the Old Testament would make the word an it, and yet when we get to John chapter 1, it becomes a him? Unless there is some underlying reason. So automatically, we assume that which should not be assumed. So now we consume, we, we are assuming that, that what, what was being spoken of then, uh, uh, what is being spoken of as him, of the word is a hymn because that's what we find in our Bible until our understandings open up. And I think uh, there was that one session, I think I brought that in here because I paid $500 for the page. And then I went to a, a, a store of antique Bibles when I was uh, in the Midwest. And when I went and saw them, I was just amazed by it. And I said to the person, can you give me, this is, the, this is a 15th century Bible? Yes, can you give me 1 John chapter one chapter 1, uh, 1 John chapter 1. And so they gave me 1 John chapter 1, and I read it, and it said, it, and not him. And I said, can I have that page? Of course, they sell the pages. <laughs> and so it's in my office. Uh, and and I, I think I did show that to you all. Yeah, I did, because it's a part of this presentation. All right, so we're going to be coming back next week, and we're going to give the biblical proof and the historical proof concerning uh, this Logos conspiracy is God's word, first of all, is it God? It's no more God than my word is me. It's God from the standpoint that my, my word is associated with me, and so the word was God, and when the word was made flesh, what that basically meant was every prophecy that was made by Messiah was going to be fulfilled and was ultimately fulfilled with the birth of Jesus. So the word or the prophecies became a reality. And when we get back next week, we're going to go more into this logos theology conspiracy of changing the word and it, which is the word that comes out of my mouth, to a him, making that him Jesus, making Jesus the logos, which, which, which he is not no more than it's just the power of his speech like it's the power of my speech and we'll go more into that detail next week amen i remember walking through an airport <clears throat> and i saw a sign that i will never forget and that sign said free advice is worth what it cost and so if something is valuable then you can determine its value by what you give. And I'm saying to one and all that as you view these presentations, these PowerPoints, these words from the Lord, and you think within yourself, this is valuable, then the value of what you've received is determined by what you give. Because free advice is worth what it costs. And so I say to you, to one and all, that after hearing and seeing these presentations, if they have value to you, these PowerPoint presentations, these words from the scriptures presentation, whether it's a dime or more, Show the value of what you received by your monetary for a good cause giving. Because as um, one of Saul's, the future King Saul's servants said as they were attempting to find 
Saul's father's lost uh, asses and knew that there was a seer called Samuel. And so Saul said, well, we'll go to Samuel and see if he know where they are. And the seer reminded Samuel, free advice is worth what it costs and we cannot go without a piece of money in our hands. So show your appreciation of what you have seen and heard in your giving by the information that is a part of this presentation at the end of each presentation. Thank you.